Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Really pleased to have you with us for the next hour. So as Hannah said, I'm going to talk you through the fundamentals of the PGM market, and I'm going to take a look at something of what the future holds as well. Uh, let me just get the standard disclaimer out of the way, so nothing I am saying today should be construed as advice to do anything. So in the aims of this webinar in the next hour, we aim to give you a good um, uh, grounding in the PGM market, so insight into the structure of supply and demand. I'm going to talk about recycling because that's absolutely crucial to the way the PGM markets function. I'm going to talk a little bit or at least highlight the existence of the global PGM network because that's you know, clearly quite important in the current geopolitical context. And having done all that, I'm going to take a look at what the future holds. But just to set expectations, I'm not going to show you our forecasts. Uh, we don't make those public. And in any case, a lot of this stuff is, you know, pretty nascent and quite difficult to forecast. But there are certain things we can say based on the structure of supply and demand. There are certain trends we can forecast with some certainty. So I'll be talking about those. So to start with the fundamentals then, and, and the real fundamentals, what is the platinum group? It's a group of six metals that includes platinum. They are grouped together on the periodic tables, so there's obviously some commonality of properties between the metals. They do also tend to occur as a group in the Earth's crust, so they're usually mined in association with each other. And the six metals are platinum, palladium, rhodium, ruthenium, iridium, and osmium. And I've faded osmium out. We don't talk about it much. It's, it's really niche, not widely supplied, not widely used. So we're going to talk about the other five metals which are in widespread industrial use. And there are some unofficial subgroups within the platinum group, and it's just worth bearing these in mind because they do have implications for the structure of supply and demand of the individual metals. And what I'm showing you here is the amount of each metal that was put on the market in 2023 in tonnes. And I think the first thing it will probably leap out at you is the pink there, the minor metals. And I think it's obvious why we refer to rhodium, ruthenium and iridium as the minor metals or the minor PGM. It's got nothing to do with their importance. They're very important. It's just that they occur in relatively minor quantities in the Earth's crust. They're therefore supplied in quite small quantities. They've got quite small markets. Relative to them, platinum, palladium have quite large liquid markets. They're also the metals in which it's, or the PGMs in which it's easiest to invest. So there is this investment component to the platinum and palladium market that has implications potentially for liquidity or volati volatility in a particular year. It's not impossible to invest in rhodium, ruthenium and iridium if you really want to, but it, it's quite difficult to do so. And then lastly, the three metals highlighted in turquoise, so rhodium's kind of straddling the two groups there. Those are the three metals used in automotive emissions control, so those are the catalytic converter metals, platinum, palladium and rhodium. That has implications not just for demand for these three metals, but also, as we'll see, for their supply. So I've started with supply, so let's take a snapshot of supply in 2023. This is the metal that was placed on the market last year by source. And there's a note there in the heading, this excludes closed loop recycling. So just bear that in mind, we're going to come back to that later. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is recycling. So there is this significant component of recycled supply in the PGM markets. And that is important to consider. The reason for that is because recycled or secondary PGM and primary or virgin PGM are completely fungible. There's no difference in their properties. So, you know, geologists tend to only look at mine supply. If you're only going to look at mine supply, you will significantly underestimate the amount of platinum, palladium and rhodium available on the market. And you can see there the largest single source of the supply is auto scrap, so that's catalytic converters. So you can see how the use of platinum, palladium and, ro and rhodium on catalytic converters does mean they've got the significant secondary supply component in their markets. E-scrap, I mean, e-waste is generally being processed for copper and gold, but it does uh, produce quite a lot of palladium as well and a little bit of platinum. And then jewellery recycling, I mean, we don't see much of that in the West, really. But in Asia, you do sometimes see old um, platinum jewellery being returned and then that metal is sold on the market. You will note there's no iridium and ruthenium in those recycled columns. That's not to say there's no iridium ruthenium recycling. Again, we're going to come back to that. It just means that there's not much of a secondary component to the iridium and ruthenium markets at the moment. Then if we look at mining, 
you can see the PGM markets are still very dependent on mining supply or mine supply, and that's particularly true for iridium and ruthenium. And within that mining, you can see the importance of South Africa. So South Africa is the largest single source of the PGM. It's the largest single source of platinum and the minor metals. And it's sort of neck and neck with Russia in terms of supplying palladium. So Russia, fairly significant palladium supplier. You've got Zimbabwe, North America, and then a few bits and pieces in the rest of the world. Now, it's quite important to consider how this mining takes place, because again, that has implications for the market. So what I'm going to do here is just take a look at the mining and I'm going to fade out anything that is technically produced as a co-product or a byproduct of something else. So starting with South Africa, I mean, really, these are PGM mines in South Africa, but we've always kind of historically referred to them as platinum mines because platinum is the main metal that they are producing, but they produce a significant amount of palladium. So we can call palladium a co-product of platinum in South Africa. And then the minor metals really on those quantities, you would only see, you can only really call them byproducts of platinum. Zimbabwe has got a similar structure, so mainly sort of platinum, but very much this palladium co-product and small quantities of the minor metals. Russia, I've, I've faded that out completely because really PGM production in Russia is happening as a byproduct of nickel mining. But um, given the value of that palladium, I, I think you'd, you'd call palladium a co-product of nickel in Russia as well. Now, North America is interesting. It's the only region in which you find palladium being mined in its own right. So there's one palladium mine in Canada. There's one palladium mine in the US. But elsewhere in North America, PGM extraction is happening as a byproduct of nickel copper mining. And generally in the rest of the world, that's the case as well. So this association of the metals with each other and the status of some of the metals as being co-products, or in the case of the minor metals, entirely byproducts, really does mean that supply is pretty inelastic. So you're not going to see that economics 101 relationship between supply and demand for the individual metals. The basket of mining is, is really driven, or you know, we call that the basket of mining, is really driven by what demand overall for the basket looks like. So having highlighted the importance of South Africa then, let's just take a closer look at what's sitting in the ground there. And it's really a very significant deposit indeed. So the Bushveld Igneous Complex, what happened is about two billion years ago or so, there was this vast upwelling of magma from the Earth's mantle into the Earth's crust. There's plenty of PGM down in the Earth's mantle. We can't get to it, so it's a good thing that some of it came to us. And we had this intrusion into the Earth's crust to form this vast kind of saucer-shaped uh, igneous complex. And it really is vast, so um, hundreds of kilometers from side to side. And at the moment, we're kind of mining the rim of the saucer, you could say. So in some places, the edge of that saucer does outcrop on the surface. So we do have a couple of open cast PGM mines, but generally it's sitting below the surface and we, we're seeing shafts being sunk. So 700 meters, a kilometer, two kilometers deep to get to the rim of the saucer. But there's plenty of saucers still there. And the geologists say essentially there's enough PGMs in this Bushveld igneous complex to meet our needs for decades. Whether it's extracted is actually less a question of geology and more a question of just how much investment is put in. If the investment is made to sink new shafts, to access new areas of ore, then that metal will be extracted. So plenty of PGM there to meet our needs. And we've got to sort of consider how desirable that is. And I'm going to talk about that for a minute because I know people do have concerns sometimes around mining in Africa. So let's just take a closer look at how this PGM mining is done in South Africa. And the first thing I'm going to say is that it is carried out by large publicly listed companies that have to report to their shareholders. As such, it's legal mining. There's no artisanal mining. And because it's legal mining, it's subject to uh, stringent regulation in South Africa. The mining industry is highly regulated in South Africa. Um, really strict labor and EHS um, requirements. You're not going to find any child labor in these mines. Uh, and of course, they do need to rep report to their shareholders. So. That's who's doing the mining. And then in terms of geopolitics, I'm, I'm not going to comment too much on geopolitics. I'm just going to point out the value of PGMs to South Africa, which is really actually very significant. 
So the South African government regulates PGM mining. It doesn't control or own the PGM that's produced, that's sold by the companies, but you can see the economic value of the sale of those PGMs. So in terms of whether South Africa can afford to play geopolitical political games with its PGMs, even if it wanted to, I mean, really, you'd have to question whether that's uh, possible. And then the last thing to say, and to, to highlight is the socioeconomic benefit of PGM mining in South Africa, which is really significant. It's in the nature of this mining that there is a, a lot of investment in local communities. Uh, indeed, that's mandated. So to the extent that we're going to see PGMs used in the energy transition, and we are certainly going to see that, and I'll talk about that later, PGMs really contribute to the goals of a just energy transition. So those, those socioeconomic benefits obviously feed into a number of UN SDGs, um, really important in the African context, but that's not to say that CO2 footprint is not a consideration. So the CO2 footprint of PGM mining is currently high. That's partly due to the fact that the PGM occur in relatively low grades. So we're talking grams per tonne in the ore or parts per million. So you've got to mine a lot of rock to get to the metal. And it's partly because energy supply in South Africa is heavily fossil fuel dependent. Now, the mining companies are investing to reduce their CO2 footprint. But the other way that the CO2 footprint of PGMs in use is addressed is through recycling. So let's talk about recycling. As I said, absolutely fundamental to the way the PGM market functions. And this recycling, this routine recycling we do of PGMs means that the overall footprint of CO2 in use is dramatically lower than it would be if we just relied on mining. And there are two different recycling loops. So the closed loop is closed because it's a true circle. So this is true circularity. Metal is returned to the original owner. It's also closed in the sense that it's kind of invisible. And the reason for this is because when we report demand, we report demand for new metal. So metal having to be bought from the market and we net off closed loop recycling from that reported demand. So that makes this recycling invisible, but it is in fact very substantial. The closed loop is enormous. It's a substantial part of the sustainability of PGM use because obviously it dramatically lowers the requirement for fresh infusions of metal. And an example here would be a PGM process catalyst, for example. So you'd see purchase of platinum, for example, to use on process catalyst in a petrochemical facility. That ca process catalyst has a lifetime of five or six years, say. At the end of the life, it's removed, it's sent for refining, the platinum is recovered, it's credited back to the original owner who gets to use that platinum on the replacement charge. And that happens over and over again. So a lot of PGM going round and round this closed loop over and over again. The open loop we've already touched on, this is the source of secondary supply to the market, and it's open in that the sense that the circle is not closed, so this metal is returned to the market. It's also open in that it's transparent because we publish this as reported secondary supply, and of course the classic example is catalytic converters, so the automaker will buy the PGM, it will be put onto the catalytic converter and sold with the vehicle, and then at the end of the vehicle's life that PGM becomes available for recovery by specialist collectors who will sell the metal for profit. So total recycling of the PGMs is the sum of the open loop and the closed loop. And we make it really hard for you to do that sum because we don't tell you what the closed loop is. Now, in terms of recycling going forward, there are some things we can say. And the first thing to say is that recycling volumes will remain high. So what do we know about the closed loop? We know that there is an enormous amount of metal sitting above ground. So over years and decades, PGMs have been installed in a number of different industries around the world. They don't tend to disappear. PGMs don't tend to get lost. They remain recyclable and recoverable. So we've got this really significant installed base of PGM around the world. So like a, a large urban mine, if you want to call it that. That metal, to the extent that equipment or catalyst has to be renewed, is happening in closed loop. So it's not available to anybody else. The example I've put there is a picture of catalyst gauze, and what this is, is it's actually a thin platinum rhodium wire that is literally knitted into a gauze, and those gauzes are used as catalyst in uh, nitric acid plants, so producing nitric acid for fertilizer, for example. So clearly that application is still needed. 
if in future we were to see a technology change or shift in the market that meant that that use of PGM was no longer needed to the same extent, then the closed loop would become open, the metal would be returned to the market. So the installed base is a potential source of future availability. And of course, that is what's supporting this continued closed loop recycling. What about the open loop then? So what we can say about the open loop is that these volumes are going to remain significant as well. And we know that because we can look at the amount of PGM that's gone on uh, catalytic converters on new vehicles uh, over the past years and decades. And this is a chart showing exactly that, the amount of platinum, palladium and rhodium onto new vehicles every year since 1985. It's our historical data series. It's available for free on the website if you want to see it. And what you can see is just how much that usage has grown. This is a really robust market for the PGMs at the moment. A little bit of a dip there because of the pandemic, but you can see how um, significant that market is now. And it's going to remain a robust market for some time. Yes, of course, um, battery vehicles are eroding the share of uh, vehicles with catalytic converters in production. But at the same time, we're seeing tightening emissions regulations, so stricter limits on the pollutants that can be emitted from vehicles. So that really does support the amount of PGM that's being used. So all this PGM is going out into vehicles on, on the road. They're doing their thing. They're lasting for 15, 20, 25 years. And then that metal is going to be available for recovery. And we know it's going to be recycled because this recycling is value driven. So the incentive is there to recover the metal once the vehicle is scrapped. Even if PGM prices were to decline, there's still enough value in this metal to incentivize its recycling. So plenty of this metal still to come back in the open loop. So I've spoken about how this demand for PGMs in catalytic converters has grown, and I'm going to show you now just how important that catalytic converter demand is to the PGMs. So what we have here is a slide showing the usage of PGMs, and the title is a little bit misleading because it's net of closed loop. So I'm not showing you the amount of PGM that's gone on to all the new equipment and new catalysts made every year, because to give you that number, I would have to add uh, much of the closed loop back in. What I'm showing you here is reported demand. So this is metal purchased from the market. Where is it going? And you can see for platinum, palladium, and rhodium, there's a lot of pink on the slide. That's uh, catalytic converter demand. There's a little bit of fuel cell vehicle demand in, in the pink segment for platinum, but for palladium and rhodium, that's entirely catalytic converter demand. So you can see just how dominant that is now in the markets for those metals. Uh, okay. Catalytic converters are also the single largest market for platinum at the moment. The jewelry market is rather smaller than it used to be. Uh, that's been in decline for the last decade. So we sometimes see people forecasting platinum jewelry demand in line with GDP. I and mean, that's certainly not the trend we've seen um, over the past years. And that's just a function of, of tastes really changing in the uh, large Chinese market for platinum jewelry in particular. But jewelry still a significant market for platinum. And then we've got the spread of other applications in various industries. And that's true for palladium and rhodium as well. All three metals really important process catalysts in the production of chemicals and fuels. Uh, there's a variety of, well, they're used to different extent in dental and biomedical alloys, in the production of pharmaceuticals, and of course, platinum anti-cancer drugs really important in cancer treatment. Glass making is, inter is interesting and uses platinum and rhodium. It's, it's a rather small sliver on the rhodium uh, chart there, but there is some green there. So what this is, is it's not producing kind of bottle glass that we have in our kitchens, but if you want to produce high quality glass, uh, free of defects for pharmaceutical glass or uh, fiberglass for wind turbine blades, for example, or uh, cover glass, uh, panel glass for LCD TVs, you're going to use a platinum rhodium alloy in your production facility to protect certain components as you pass that molten glass um, over or through them. Electronics, so the PGMs are quite important metals in the electronics industry, uh, palladium in particular. Platinum is used in hard disks. Uh, now, we don't see many hard disks in our consumer electronics anymore, but they are still the mainstay of data center storage. So a lot of hard disks going into data centers. And then a range of other smaller industrial applications. Coming on to ruthenium and iridium, you can see why I put these together, because immediately you can see the structure of demand for these metals is really quite different. Obviously, they're not used in catalytic converters, but they do have a range of really quite important industrial applications. So again, both metals are used as catalysts in the production of chemicals, less so fuels, more chemicals in this case. 
Uh, electronics, again, really important in the electronics industry, particularly ruthenium, which is uh, ubiquitous in chip resistors and is also used in hard disk technology today. Iridium is also used in the electronics industry. Uh, certain OLEDs, for example, use uh, iridium organometallic complexes. And iridium is also used in the form of solid crucibles to grow crystals. And those crystals are used as wave filters in our mobile phones, for example. And then the electrochemical aspect of, of iridium and ruthenium use is really important. These are really uh, useful electrochemical metals in existing applications today, such as the chloralkali industry, and of course in future applications, so uh, the production of renewable electrolytic hydrogen by proton exchange membrane electrolysis, that relies on iridium and it's making increasing use of ruthenium as well. Now iridium is also, also has an electrochemical application in the use uh, or in the production of ultra thin copper foil by electrodeposition. And that ultra thin copper foil is used as the current collectors in lithium ion batteries. So iridium is also a critical metal for battery electric vehicles. And then other industrial uses. And I'm just going to draw your attention to the gray segment on the iridium uh, chart there, because much of that is spark plugs. So uh, iridium tips on spark plugs, long life plugs that we like using in our gasoline vehicles. And that's interesting because very unusually for a PGM application, uh, those iridium tips on spark plugs are not generally recycled at end of life. That's changing, particularly given where the iridium price is at the moment. So if we were to see significant recycling of iridium spark plug tips at end of life, that would then constitute a source of secondary metal supply to the market. So keep an eye on that one. So we've looked at supply, demand and recycling. And now we've got to ask the question, how is that all connected? And it is actually quite an important question because the PGMs are valuable commodities. Um, they tend to be or rely on specialists, specialists to work with them and process them. They're not that easy to process. So it's, it's led to kind of specialist companies that do this and serve a global market. So we've got to ask the question of how do producers or suppliers get connected to users, to fabricators and to refiners? And what's happened over decades as the industrial use of these metals has become established is we've seen this formation of what we call the global PGM network. And this really is quite a mature network uh, and it sees metal moving around the world fairly routinely. And a lot of this is facilitated by what we call the hubs, liquidity hubs or clearing locations. So there are five of these that serve the wider market. I'm going to start by talking about the hub in Shanghai because I want to highlight how different the PGMs are in this respect from the battery metals, for example. So China doesn't play a particularly significant role in global PGM supply chains. It's dependent on PGM imports today. So PGM moves into China and then it tends to stay in China because China is what we call a closed refining market. So any PGM uh, that needs to be recycled has to be recycled within China and reused in China. So the hub in Shanghai is really serving the Chinese market. The rest of the world, with a couple of exceptions, fairly important exceptions, but a couple of exceptions, the rest of the world is really one global market for PGMs. And much of that movement is facilitated by four hubs. There are two ingot hubs and two sponge hubs. So ingot or plate, that's a picture up there, not of ingot, but of plate, is, is the form of metal that's generally sort of held by banks and used for trading. And the two ingot hubs are in the global financial centers in Zurich and London. And then sponge is a powdered form of metal. That's usually what industrial users buy, um, simply because it's quite hard to dissolve an ingot, so, so sponge is much easier to work with. And there are two sponge hubs. There's one in the US operated by Johnson Matthey and one in the UK at Royston, also operated by Johnson Matthey. So what do the hubs do? Well, they facilitate things like secure storage, secure shipment, verification of quality, uh, verification of good delivery status. So there's a really strong responsible sourcing program in the PGM industry. So that is verified. And they also act to support liquidity. So how can we think about this? Well, if you have an account at a bank, for example, so you've got a bank balance, the bank doesn't set aside a certain or typically doesn't set aside a certain number of notes and coins with your name on them and they're held against your balance. 
Rather, you've got an account balance and when you want to withdraw money, physical money, then obviously the bank needs to ensure there's enough notes available so that when you go to the ATM, they can dispense the notes you want. And something similar happens with PGMs. You can hold metal on account and then when you physically want to use that metal, we need to be sure there's enough liquidity to support that physical use of the metal. So I think you can see from this that there's regular crossing of borders of PGMs, and, and that is definitely the case. So I'm not going to go into this in too much more detail. We do have a PGM supply chains white paper on the website that you're welcome to take a look at. There's a couple of case studies within that, and we also use our own situation at JM as a case study. So we supply catalyst that goes on catalytic converters, um, and eventually we, we get those catalytic converters back quite often to recycle them. And in this value chain, completing this circle, there are multiple border crossings of PGM. So this is an optimized global industry that's very mature, it's working well. So from that point of view, too much of a domestic focus on PGM supply chains is probably not that helpful or sensible. So bringing it all together, we've got this PGM market ecosystem, the global PGM market. I mean, clearly it's a notional thing, but we've got this metal moving in from the primary suppliers, the open loop recycling supplying secondary metal to the market, moving out and being sold into the automotive industry, jewelry, a variety of different industrial applications, most of which are supported by this closed loop recycling. And then of course, investment. So we're interested in physical investment. So there's ways to invest in things that don't involve physical movement of metal. We're interested in investment that actually involves metal being taken off the market or put back on the market. So exchange traded funds, for example. So how can you see what's going on here? Well, one way of doing that is to look at our PGM market report, which is published uh, every year in May. So there's a new one coming in May this year. And what this, that does is it gives you the status of supply and demand for the previous full year and a look at what's going to happen in the current year. So we report supply, primary and secondary, and we report demand, so automotive and industrial net of closed loop, jewelry and physical investment demand. Now, this picture implies balance, and it's important to emphasize that we don't expect balance. So supply and demand are not going to balance for the PGMs. And because we're talking about relatively inelastic supply meeting relatively inelastic demand, certainly in the case of the automotive and industrial demand, we just don't expect these markets to tend to balance. It's absolutely normal to see an imbalance. So in any given year for a particular metal, you can have more supply than demand, or in fact, a, a deficit, so a shortfall in supply. And what we see happening is this movement of market stocks, and that's what acts to balance the market. So you'll either see surplus metal moving in to replenish market stocks, or if there's a deficit and a shortfall in supply, you'll see a drawdown of market stocks. So imbalance is normal. When life gets interesting is when you've got a sustained imbalance in one direction or the other. And of course, a sustained deficit is going to deplete market stocks. We don't know generally how big market stocks are, but obviously a sustained deficit is going to draw those down. And a sustained surplus at some point is going to erode willingness to hold excess metal. So life gets interesting with a sustained imbalance. So let's take a look at how the balance of these markets has evolved to date. And again, this is uh, our PGM market report data. It's available on the website. And I'm going to start by looking at the platinum market balance. And what this is, is it's supply, uh, uh, which is primary supply, secondary supply added together, and then subtracting automotive, industrial, physical investment and jewelry demand. So this is the imbalance, and this is what stocks would have to do to balance the market. And you can see for platinum, we had a few years of deficit. I mean, we had a couple of years of surplus, a couple of years of deficit. So generally this market doesn't balance. And then you can see the price trend in the pink there. And clearly there's not really any correlation between the price trend and the fundamentals. And that is true for platinum. The platinum price really is driven more by a variety of different macroeconomic factors, strength of the dollar, oil price, cost of borrowing, and so on, and less by the fundamentals of the PGM market itself. However, there are significant above ground stocks of platinum. This is a highly liquid 
market. So really very substantial stocks. I mean, if you count jewelry as a platinum stock, which, which it kind of is, it's a pretty sticky one. People don't tend to like selling their jewelry, but in theory, that's a stock of platinum. But there is also substantial stocks in really quite liquid forms. So to some extent, that might have something to do with the relative price weakness of platinum today. And then palladium and rhodium, quite interesting. I'm going to take a look at them side by side. And um, I'm going to start by looking at platinum, uh, palladium, sorry. And here you can immediately see the sustained imbalance that I was talking about. So this has been the palladium market in the last few years, a sustained deficit. And why did this happen? Well, I showed you that chart earlier of that growth in catalytic converter demand that really was most pronounced for palladium. So you had the significant growth in demand for palladium meeting inelastic supply, and this is what happened, an imbalanced market. And for a while that didn't really matter because there were significant palladium stocks. So earlier in this uh, time series, so I'm not showing you earlier on, but we had a number of years of palladium surpluses that built up palladium stocks. So when we entered this period of deficit, those stocks were drawn down. We didn't see a price reaction. And then the stocks started getting a little bit tighter and at that point we saw the, the palladium price react and you can see that very clearly there and that really did um, peak at a, a high level and that is starting to normalize now because we are seeing more liquidity in the palladium market now similar thing happened for rhodium but rhodium is a much smaller market than palladium so here we saw not many years of deficit almost immediately leading to a price reaction. And in reality, we'd had a few years of a relatively tight rhodium market. So when we actually moved into deficit, the price reacted almost straight away and it reacted pretty dramatically. Again, that is starting to normalize. So this is exactly what you would expect in this much smaller market, much less liquid market, is a higher degree of this price volatility. So what about ruthenium and iridium then? Because they were also small markets, particularly iridium. So what I'm, I'm not going to do is I'm not going to show you a historic, a full historical series for the market balance. Uh, reason being, for a long time, you know, the mines produced ruthenium and iridium as a byproduct. So for a long time, they kind of sat in the vaults until someone needed them. And then, you know, ruthenium and iridium would be sold according to what people needed. So, that, you know, there wasn't much interesting to say for, for a while about these metals. And you can see the price sort of trended along um, at a sort of quite a flat level. But then both metals saw a price movement in around 2020, back end of 2020. And, and this really wasn't driven by the fundamentals. So you can see there we're not showing really a significant deficit building up in these metals. And yet we've seen this price reaction. Now, clearly the two metals have quite different prices. So the prices are very different, but the sort of trend looks fairly similar. And what this reflects is again, markets that are small with inelastic supply, but of increasing interest for new applications and particularly the energy transition applications of these metals. So that is really what's leading to this historically quite high price for these metals. So that's where we've come from. Where are we going? And as I said, I'm not going to forecast this for you. I am going to talk about certain things we know about the future and why we at JM actually think the world is going to have to use PGMs in future. So let's move on to that starting with what we know. So we know that the energy transition for the PGMs is both a challenge and an opportunity. Why is it a challenge? Well, the largest market for PGMs is catalytic converters. Catalytic converters get fitted to vehicles with internal combustion engines and the production of those vehicles must decline and will decline. So we know that by soon after 2050 or as soon after 2050 as we can, we need a road vehicle fleet not road vehicle sales, a road vehicle fleet that no longer emits fossil carbon. So that's the single largest market for PGMs. And on an overall basis, catalytic converters accounts for about 60% of total PGM use today. And we know that market's going to decline. Clearly, that is a challenge. It's also an opportunity. And why is it an opportunity? Because of this inelasticity in supply. So we know secondary supply of these metals is going to continue value-driven recycling of highly recyclable metals. 
We know primary supply is going to continue. So anywhere the PGMs are extracted as byproducts of nickel copper mining, clearly that's going to mining is going to continue. And we know we're going to want continued mining of platinum in South Africa because we need the platinum for fuel cell vehicles. And the extent to which that platinum is mined, it's going to bring the basket of other PGMs along with it. So that immediately creates this opening for new applications. So it's a really significant market development opportunity. And when it comes to critical metals, it's a fairly unique opportunity because obviously for the battery metals, we're seeing that new demand in battery electric vehicles coming on top of existing demand and creating supply stress. That's not the situation for fuel cell vehicles. Let me stress, fuel cell vehicles are replacement demand for platinum. They're not going to stress platinum supply. So that's really quite a nice opportunity. So just to outline that, what do the PGMs offer if you want to develop a new applications for them? So there's continued mining from an established mining base. So the mines are, are there, the, the ore body is known. It's continued recycling, which is happening in fully mature recycling infrastructure, so globally optimized recycling infrastructure, which by the way, largely sits in the West. We're going to see these natural shifts in demand. And then we've got this well-established focus in the PGM industry. It's really part of our DNA. This value-driven focus on circularity and maximized efficiency of PGM use. Now that efficiency question is one I'm gonna come back to because it's absolutely crucial as we look forward to the energy transition. Because this is the question. So yes, we've got an opportunity to develop new applications for the PGMs, but why bother? Are we really going to need PGMs in future? Aren't batteries and electrification going to do everything? And obviously, you know, some of us don't think that, that we still do hear this question, aren't batteries and electrification going to do everything? So I'm going to address that question. I'm going to do it by looking at the International Energy Agency's data. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at their climate scenario that is the most ambitious transition. So I'm not looking at their forecast for the pathway that we're probably on. I'm looking at the uh, projection for the pathway we would need to be on to be fully in line with the aims of the Paris Climate Agreement. And that's their net zero emissions by 2050 scenario. And that's what this scenario says. So starting with how we carry our energy. So this is the form in which we consume energy. And you can see today, electricity roughly serves about a fifth of our energy consumption. And there's going to be a tremendous effort to electrify energy demand. So we're going to see that in battery vehicles. That's electrifying road vehicle demand. Uh, heat pumps, for example, in buildings is electrifying buildings energy use. So that tremendous effort in electrification is going to expand the proportion of electricity in our energy consumption, possibly to just over 40% by 2040, and then at best just over 50% by 2050. And I say at best because this is the most ambitious scenario and it really significantly outstrips the pathway we're currently on. So at best, electricity is not going to do everything. At best, it's going to do half of our energy consumption. And that's going to be a tremendous effort to accomplish even this. What about batteries? Well, they're absolutely crucial in the energy transition but generally they're going to be deployed in road vehicles. And again, co coincidentally, road vehicles are about a fifth of our total energy consumption. And of that 20%, about half of that energy consumption is actually happening in commercial vehicles, heavy duty trucks, vans. These are really significant energy users. So even if every single passenger vehicle on the road, so again, I'm not talking passenger vehicle sales, I'm talking about every single passenger vehicle on the road, were to be a battery vehicle, we would have addressed 10% of our current energy consumption. And we're quite far, by the way, from having every passenger car on the road be a battery vehicle. We're currently at about just over 3% of passenger cars on the road being battery vehicles. So there's a tremendous amount more energy consumption to address. Now, the fact that we're using batteries and electrification in buildings and road transport is going to make them more efficient. So it's going to kind of shrink down the proportion of those sectors in our energy consumption, but it still leaves all this other energy consumption that has to be addressed somehow. So can't we just do that with batteries and electricity as well? Why not just do more batteries, do more electricity? And the reason we say we can't do that is because it is fundamentally limited and it's fundamentally limited by metals. Electrification is 
an intense user of certain critical metals. So here I've highlighted cobalt, lithium, nickel, and copper. And again, this is the International Energy Agency's data, again, reflecting the projected rise in requirements for their net zero emission scenario. Uh, and this is the rise in requirements by 2040, if we were to be on that ambitious pathway. The overall demand for these four metals rising by 70%, cobalt and nickel demand more than doubling, lithium tenfold increase, and copper demand rising by more than 60%, which in some ways is the most challenging. And this 70% rise is almost entirely driven by this quadrupling in clean energy demand for these metals. Part of what's driving this is the expansion in renewable power generation. So we are going to have to deploy vastly more wind turbines, vastly more solar panels than we have today. Again, we're nowhere near having this, the amount of renewable generation that we need. That's going to contribute to some of this rise, and that's in the dark purple there. Far and away, the biggest driver is electric, the expansion of electricity infrastructure, so proper cabling and electric vehicles. Uh, so those batteries going into passenger cars uh, and, and to some extent into commercial vehicles. So the question is, can this rise in requirement be met? And that's a question relating to just the fundamental amount of these metals that can be extracted. And then the other question is, how sustainably can it be met? Because, of course, if we're starting to talk about extractive processes like deep sea mining, for example, then clearly we're looking at an energy transition that is relying on some fairly unsustainable uh, practices. So this is why we cannot expect batteries and electrification to do everything. They're doing a lot. They're crucial. They can't do everything. So what's the solution here? And it's fairly obvious we're going to need complementary technologies. But the point here is that those complementary technologies are going to have to use less critical metal because they simply cannot add to that burden of critical metal intensity that we are already facing. And the nice thing about PGM based technologies is they are highly metal efficient. And the key example for me here is fuel cell vehicles. And you can see it here comparing the critical metals in a conventional vehicle, a fuel cell vehicle, and a battery vehicle. The battery vehicle is going to give you energy efficiency, which is key. Why do you want to deploy fuel cell vehicles alongside battery vehicles to alleviate some of that critical metals intensity? Because fuel cell vehicles give you critical metals efficiency. And yes, that does translate through to cost as well. This is not versus, this is not either or, this is not a competition. This is about deploying complementary technologies alongside electrification. And we're going to have to look at ways of spreading the energy transition load, if you like, across more metals. And the key thing here to look at is process catalysts, which to me is really interesting. I mean, we make a lot of use of process catalysts in the fossil fuel economy. We're going to make even more use of process catalysts in the energy transition because there's going to be the significant need for sustainable fuels, sustainable chemicals, sustainable materials. So we're going to see a more complex processing environment in future. Nickel process catalyst is kind of the mainstay. So nickel is really the mainstay of um, process catalysts today. We can't just rely on nickel to do everything. Clearly, it's going to be under supply stress because of its use in batteries. So we do need to look at spreading that load. And palladium, generally anything that nickel can catalyze, palladium can catalyze, but it does so with much smaller quantities. Now, we've got this kind of conventional thinking that it's always better to move away from an expensive, rare metal to one that is more abundant and cheap. And actually, when it comes to the energy transition, we are going to have to flip that thinking on its head, which is quite counterintuitive. Obviously, not in all cases, but in some cases, it's going to make sense to use palladium rather than nickel to complement nickel. So this is what we think is going to evolve. It's going to have to evolve through the energy transition. And we do think the PGM opportunity, which exists, we know it exists, we know it has to be harnessed, or we believe it really has to be harnessed. There is a risk, we think, of constraints on certain critical metals, either delaying or even derailing the energy transition. Clearly, there's a need for complementary technologies, because not even in the most ambitious scenario do we see electrification doing everything. And because we need those complementary technologies, they have to be enabled by different critical metals, or at least make much less use of certain critical metals, and they need to be really efficient in those terms to avoid adding to the unsustainable extraction burden. So a lot of people looking at new applications for the PGMs today in the energy transition, fuel cell vehicles definitely, but a range of other applications that are 
at an earlier stage and therefore rather more difficult to forecast. And it's not just the energy transition, waste. We're going to have to get a lot better at managing our waste as a civilization. There's a range of potential PGM applications there. And of course, health and electronics, both important growth markets for the future, again, with a range of PGM applications there. So when we're forecasting these markets, it's really quite easy to forecast the markets and the applications that we know. What's a lot harder to do is to come up with a rigorous forecast for applications that are still nascent. But we need to bear in mind that those are going to materialise. So that's enough from me. There's plenty of information on our website and I hope I've left enough time for questions. Thank you.